God, thank God, thank God. Praise God. I want to see his glory. I want his glory to be evident. Amen. God bless you. You may be seated. So glad you're in the youth center tonight. Amen. We're usually, this is our annual service, we're usually the kids take over the auditorium, so we're in the multi-purpose room with a keyboard and a one mic, so thank God for these youth. They let us invade their space and lead us into a time of worship. Amen. How wonderful is that? Amen. I've got a couple of announcements so I can find them. Storm Christmas party. Your party is this Friday at 7 in the Youth Center. For all those that are part of Storm Youth, please bring $3 and a gift for exchange. The gift should be $10 or less. They do have a dollar store, but they went to $1.25, but you could get something there. Christmas musical this Saturday, don't forget, at 6 o'clock, going to be a great time. The kids are in there practicing. We'll have them at 6, and then we'll do a, uh, they do the cocos and cookies afterwards, a time of fellowship. And then Sunday 11, they'll, they'll do it again. They practice so hard on this, and we want to cheer them on. We're a church for the next generation, amen? We want them to know they are a vitally important part of this church. Amen, amen, amen. I think I got them all. So let's look tonight at the Word of God for a while. And we are, we've been looking at this subject of overcoming fear, and that's where we're going to take off again today. I stopped some weeks back. It was a Thanksgiving service, and I think the week before that was Brother uh, Mendoza. Didn't he do a fantastic job? Our from, from Ecuador, a friend from Ecuador, he did a tremendous job. And we've been looking at this idea of overcoming fear and what does that look like and, and the weapons we have to overcome our fear. I'll pick up kind of where I left off. And we, we're looking at all this again through the lens of the account of David and Goliath. And for those who have been with us in the series, we talked about our first weapon of obedience. Just do what God said. That's our first weapon to overcome fear is just do what God said. It doesn't matter the outcome. That's up to God. What God has said, just do it. And then being faithful in that, don't just start what God has said. Finish what God has said. Do what he says to completion. And then to this third weapon is kind of an almost seemed like an outlier when I got started last week and, or a couple weeks ago, and hopefully we can pick it up and make more sense of it tonight. But this idea of, of stewardship, stewardship is the third weapon that we're going to look at to help us overcome fear. Stewardship is a weapon, and why we say it that is because it means we realize God owns everything. And we're simply resolved to manage what he has given to us. When it comes to our role on this planet, we need to remember we're not the owners. Okay? That takes a lot of pressure off of us. When we don't have to worry about whether, whether this works or this, this is not your church in that regard. This is not my church in that regard. This is God's church. And so what God wants to do with his church, we are just here to steward that. You know whose house I live in? God's house. Was it a church? No, but he owns everything. You know whose air you're breathing? Everything belongs to God, and we are just simply called to steward it. What are we doing with the resources that God has given to us? So let's look at a scripture here. James 1.17 says, Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above and cometh down from the Father of lights, with whom is no variableness, neither shadow of turning. Everything we have, again, it's not ours. It comes to us on loan from God and from our Heavenly Father, and we are to manage that property. We are to manage what he has given us, his time, his resources, his giftings, his talents, his skills that he has imparted to all of us. We're simply to manage those. So the question is not, are we owners or stewards? The question is simply, are we good stewards? Because we're all supposed to be stewards. Not owners, are we good stewards of what he has given us? So if this stewardship that we're talking about is this divine partnership between us and God, then good stewardship means we are functioning 
Again, on God's economy, on God's system, what God wants. And so much like obedience and much like faithfulness, stewardship then should keep us focused. It should keep us disciplined. It should keep us intentional in our pursuit of God's plan. Again, the question has always must always be, what does God want? Does God want to use this? Then let him use it. Does God want to take this? Then let him take it. What does God want? And it keeps us focused on that. I think so many times I talked to so many people over the years who just the will of God and this, this mystical, mysterious thing called the will of God that if you miss it, you're doomed forever. It's like, that's not how the will of God is. That's not what he's, he's trying, he's not trying to hide it from us. He's not trying to trick us into messing up so he can zap us with lightning bolts. That's not what kind of a God we serve. Our God has given us things and given us resources. Most of the time, our problem is, are we listening? Are we obeying? Are we doing what he wants us to do? And so that's what we have to understand. Are we good stewards of what he has given to us? Some of you can sing unbelievably. That's a talent. From him, are you a good steward of it? Some of you have a lot of money in the bank. It's his money. Are you a good steward of it? Some of you drive a car. It's his car. Are you, what are you talking about? Everything belongs to him. And when we realize that, it so lifts the pressure off of us that I don't have to decide what I need to do and how I can hear what God wants to do with all of this stuff. And I can become a good steward of God's plan. There's a common pattern, I believe, that the enemy tries to, to tempt to do to shake our confidence and derail us from, from being obedient, for, derail us from being uh, uh, faithful, and derail us from being a good steward of what God has given to us. God has given you, let, let's, let's go down this road for a minute. Let's say God has given you this big vision, something, and, and a uh, young man was here, uh, goes to this church, but he goes to IBC, and he was talking to me, he was here this weekend, and he said, he said, you know what, just, I'm excited about, I think what God is calling me to do, but and I'm nervous. And I said, probably if you're not nervous, it's not a big enough, it's not from God. Because if I can plan my future, then I'm not walking by faith. Our future ought to scare us a little bit. Not terrify, you understand what I'm saying, but obviously in myself, I can't do this. But what is God asking me to do? And so when, and I think what happens, God has given us a big plan many times. He's given us something that we should do in our, our, our destiny. And we're trusting God with us and with that. And we've acknowledged that, Lord, this is too big for me. I cannot do this on my own. There's impossible. I cannot do this on my own. So I'm going to have to trust in you. I'm going to have to be faithful and, and, and trust in your faithfulness. Then it seems like sometimes out of nowhere, it comes this little text message or this uh, somebody says something to you and suddenly you're not so bold anymore. Let's do this. I feel, you tell your spouse, I, I feel we need to do this. I feel, oh, I don't think we can do that. I'm not sure we can do that. And what happens, it starts depleting us stuff. Starts depleting us some, and we're trying to, all of a sudden, it knocks the wind out of our sails a little bit, and, and sometimes it happens, and again, there's nothing, there's, a, there's, there's safety in counsel, we understand things of that nature, but it, we begin to worry then, and, and that somehow, I didn't hear from God, I, I, I got this wrong, I must not have heard what God had said to me, and before you know it, our courage has been undermined by fear. Let's do this! I'm not sure we can. Well, you're right, you're probably right. Go from what to, I'm not sure either. Let's go to David and Goliath, okay? This whole scenario we've been using. Even David in this scenario. In the process to getting to Goliath, I think if we could use this and tag along with this, I think we could say the enemy, he, he sent some other fear giants, if we can call them that, along the way to catch him off guard. David was not afraid of Goliath. Okay, David comes out there. He's talking, hey, guys, why are you guys hiding out here? And all of a sudden, send me a man. It echoed through that valley. He turns around. Who is this dipwad? What in the world is he saying? You all are hiding. You're the children of God. And he's, he's mocking God. And, he's, and you guys are just hiding about this? 
What in the world are you? you got to be kidding me about this. He wasn't scared of Goliath. David wasn't scared because David feared God and knew what God wanted him to do. And so that's so he was he was headstrong in that. David understood the problem at hand was bigger than him. That giant, there was no possible way anybody in the kingdom could defeat this giant. It was impossible to do. David knew that, but David wasn't worried about that because he knew who his God was. It's a huge difference on that. So I can imagine David asking God, how are you going to do it this time? Because he knew God was going to knock this guy out. He knew he was, God was going to take care of that. I can imagine, David, who are you going to use this time? How in the world are you going to get him out of the way? I know, God, you're up to something, and you're going to take care of this. Recognizing David's faithfulness and recognizing David's obedience, it, it would seem like the enemy fell back on this next trick that I want to try to describe to you a little bit of what he would do to us. And he uses sometimes, again, I'm going to be care, very I'm not calling other people the devil, okay? Don't, don't misinterpret what I'm saying here. But sometimes he uses things and situations and people surrounding us to get inside of our head a little bit. David's resolve that caused him to question whether or not God was really on his side is what started to happen. Because first his attack came from his brother. People you know, people you can trust, people you, 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 again, they can cause you to become fearful if you're not careful. David approached this battlefield. Watch this. David approached this battlefield with two parallel approaches. Okay. One was a mandate from his earthly father and the other ended up a mandate from his heavenly father. What got him to the battlefield was his dad said, hey, bud, can you take these groceries to your brother and see how they're doing? That's what got him in position. He obeyed his dad. That's the only, he didn't know. God did not say, David, thus saith me, get down there and kill Goliath. David didn't hear those words. David never heard those words. He got to the battlefield because God said, go to the battlefield. Or his dad, I'm sorry, his dad said, go to the battlefield. So David's earthly father told him that. It's important to keep in mind Again, that he did not hear from God. He did not verbally or in it hear from God that this is what you're supposed to be doing. It's important to remember that because he went to the battlefield because his dad said, take some groceries. And so when he gets there, under orders from his earthly father, not his heavenly father, he's on the battlefield trying to figure out why everybody's hiding, trying to figure out why this monster of a man is out there screaming at everybody. And David's brother tried to make David think that his conflict was not God-ordained, but self-appointed. Okay? Remember this exchange? Let's go to 1 Samuel 17, 26. Read some verses here. David spake to the men that stood by him after he heard, heard Goliath roaring. And he said, what should be done to the guy that kills this man, this Philistine? And taketh away this reproach from Israel. For who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he should defy the armies of the living God? Right. And the people answered him after this manner, saying, So shall it be done to the man that killeth him. And then verse 28. And Eliab, David's older brother, overheard David talking to all these guys. And Eliab was mad. He got very upset. His anger was kindled against David. And he said, why in the world did you come out here? He said, and with whom hast thou left your few little sheep out there in the wilderness? You had a job to do. You probably left them. And now you're out here in somebody else's business. Why in the world are you doing this? I know your pride. I know the naughtiness of your heart. You're, you're come down that thou mightest see the battle. Verse 17, 29. And David said, what in the world did I do this time? And then I love this phrase, is there not a cause? Isn't there a reason for someone to do something? This man you have allowed for 40 days to defy the children of God and curse your God, our God, and you guys are just hiding behind us. Is there not a cause? David's own brother, do you, did you see what he was doing? He was undermining and tearing him down in the same way Goliath was tearing the army down. Goliath was out there. Send me a man. You can't do this and we'll defeat you. And he was yelling and all this stuff. And then when David said, I'll fight him, his brother said, you can't. You're not supposed to be here. 
I know you're just full of pride trying to go around. I'm, a business, I'm this big guy on this battlefield. He said, you have no business even being out here. His own brother. Well, folks, I don't know if this would be, if this would be you or not. But I think in the case that I went on that battlefield because dad said, go take your brother some food. And I get there, and then I decide, who I'm going to fight this guy. And then my older brother says, you got to be kidding me. Who do you think you are? Dad sends you out here. You're not even old enough to be on the battlefield, or you'd have been here already. You need to go back home. That's going to play with your mind. Because you're going to have to ask the question, did I hear from God? Why am I? God sent me, or my dad sent me here, but I thought... We shouldn't let people curse at God. Maybe we should. <laughs> Maybe I got this wrong. So David's wondering all these stuff. The, the next giant of fear came clothed in the robes of even leadership. Watch this one. So Saul sent for David because he had heard. There's this kid who wants to fight the giant. He calls him in, 1 Samuel 17, 32. And David said to Saul, you know, don't let anybody's heart fail because uh, fall because Fall, fail because of him, thy servant, I'll go out, I will. I'll go out and fight that Philistine. Watch what King Saul said to David. Verse 33, you're not able to go fight that Philistine. You're just a young person. And he, he has been trained from his youth how to fight, and now he's an older guy. Okay, put this in perspective. It's like one of you young guys come to me, Brother Plan. I really feel like I want to play guitar on the platform. <laughs> you can't do that. You can't play guitar on the platform. You got to be kidding me. I mean, what, how, express how you would feel about that. You know, you you probably say, "Oh, yeah, I ain't ever playing guitar on the platform again." But this was even a bigger thing. Where you know, King Saul, don't don't let anybody worry. I know I'm little, I know I'm just a young guy, but I'm going to go fight that Goliath. He said, his leader told him, you can't fight him. You're not big enough. You're just a youth. This guy's a fighter. You're not. Just like Goliath and David's brother, Saul called into question David's ability, his identity, his call. You understand, have to understand something about David, though. He was full of resolve. He was not going to give in to fear. Fear did not have a voice in his life because his focus was on God. That's where his fo My focus is not to make a name for myself. My focus is not to tell everybody how cool I am. My focus is not any of this stuff. My focus is to get rid of this guy so that the children of Israel can come out and be victorious. That was what I, my focus was. I'm focusing on God. David did not fear any of their responses because you understand his response was powerful. You go down a little bit more. 1 Samuel 17, 34. And David said unto Saul, your servant kept, keeps his father's sheep. I'm a shepherd. Work on the family farm. And one day there came out a lion and a bear and took one of the little lambs, carried him off. 35. I went out after him and smote him, got that lamb out of his mouth. And when that lion rose up against me, I grabbed him by his beard and cold cocked him and slew him. My servant slew both the lion and the bear. And this uncircumcised size village, it's no match for God. He said, I, it, seeing he hath defiled the gods, uh, uh, the, defiled the armies of the living God. Verse 37, David said, moreover, also because of all of those things, the Lord hath delivered me out of the paw of the lion. The Lord, notice this, hath delivered me out of the paw of the bear. God will also deliver me out of the hand of the Philistines. And Saul said unto David, well, go, but oh, God be with you. David was full of resolve. You're not, you're not going to back me down. My brothers say I can't do this. My leadership don't believe in, in me in this. But I have heard from God, and I have watched this in action. I have been on that field when that bear came. God delivered that bear into my hands. I was there when that lion came. God delivered that lion into my hands. And now we're not just talking about a little sheep out in daddy's pasture. We're talking about God himself, and we're talking about he's talking against the children of God. God will again deliver him into my hand. I focused on God, you have to understand David knew how to steward this mandate from the Lord because he was 
an experienced shepherd, he knew that everything he had came from and belonged to God. I'm trying my best out on dad's farm to watch those sheep. I'm doing my best that I can. And a lion came, but God gave me the victory. And a bear came and God, I'm doing my best in what God has given me. He had stewarded the sheep, if we can say it that way. He had stewarded God's anointing. Do you understand all of this? And I've said this several times during this series, but you have to understand the time this was in. David was already anointed king of Israel. He had, Samuel had already came to the house and said, you're going to be the next king. And he went back to watching sheep. And now he's out there and he's ready to fight this giant and his leader says, you can't. So I have to say, to me, it's really not a surprise when Saul said, well, use my armor that David didn't use his armor. Because instead he said, no, I've not, I've not, I've not used that. I've not practiced with that. I've not, can I say, stewarded that? He said, but I have used a sling. I have used a shepherd's pouch. So then... I ask in this lesson, what's God calling you to steward? What do you have that God is calling you to steward? Here's the thing about our God. He's not looking for fancy. He's not looking for the ones that have it all together. Or he'd pass a whole lot of us over. He's looking for those who have laid their lives down to follow him. Those who aren't full of themselves... He's looking for the faithful ones. He's looking for those who trust in him. So it, it, sometimes I think it, we get so busy and hectic and I don't have this and I don't have this and I can't do this. Ask God to renew a new vision in you. Ask God to restore the passion for his word and the plans for your life. Decide today that God's plan is enough and that what he has given you to steward will help you and hold you before him as an offering of worship. He's the owner. You're the manager. What has God given you? That's all you're supposed to steward. If he's only giving you this much, that's all you're supposed to steward. Matthew 25, 21, look at this. His Lord said unto him, well done, thou good and faithful servant. Thou hast been faithful over how many things? Few things. I'll make thee ruler over how many things? Many things. Enter thou to the joy of the Lord. The ultimate goal of every Christian is to hear those words. Good job. Thumbs up. Well done, good and faithful servant. Enter in. What a wonderful goal and, and one we should work for daily. But here's what I believe in that also. We don't have to wait until eternity to hear a uh, well done. We don't have to wait until we get there to hear that we did a good job. The first step. You ready? It's going to wow the crowd right here. The first step of being a good steward, take the first step. I know, mic drop right there, wasn't it? Here's what happens. So often we set our, 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 by the side or we bury what we have because we think it's not enough. I can't. I can't act like that person. I can't, I can't play like that person. I can't sing like that person. I can't preach like that person. I can't teach like that person. I can't connect to people like that person. And we compare ourselves among ourselves all the time. And so that what, what happens is fear begins to build up. And we just set aside or we bury what we have because we're going to say it's not enough. We compare ourselves. We compare our resources. But... We need to remember that we have now, what we have now is what we were given by God to steward. No matter how small you think it is, God has given you something. He has given us all he wants us to have at this moment. I, when I think of these things, I so often, and sorry if this doesn't make sense to you how my brain works, but I always think of when the children of Israel went into the promised land and they started taking over the promised land, the Lord said, I did not drive everybody out at the same time. Because if I would have, they'd have been overtaken with all these beasts and said would have wrecked everything. He said, I did it in increments. I think and I believe that's the way God does things. He does things in decency and in order. He does not, at three years old, give you the ability to be a missionary to wherever you're supposed to go. 
because you're going to have to be faithful over few things. And he'll make you ruler over many things. He'll open the next door and the next door and the next door. Some of the saddest things I've ever talked to people is they will come to me and they'll say things like, man, I just, I just, I have felt it for all of my life. I feel like I'm, I'm supposed to pastor a church. I'm supposed to, wonderful, that's great, that's a great calling. I'm, I'm glad, excited for you, wonderful, excited, yeah. Man, I just feel like God has placed this in my heart. Wonderful, that's wonderful, that's wonderful. Maybe, maybe one, another daughter work will start. And yeah, 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 all this stuff. And then <clears throat> they're supposed to pastor a church. Can you teach a Sunday school? No, I can't. I don't have time to do that. Can you open a door? Welcome to the sanctuary. No, I just, I, I don't know. I'll be able to do that. I've got news for them. They'll never get to where God wants them to get until they learn to steward what he has given them now. Faithful over what you have now. Rule plan, it's not fair. It's not very much. It's exactly what God wants you to have now. And if you're a steward over what he has given you now, the first step is to use what you have now. In Matthew 25, in this parable, you know it, a man, it was, a, it was a, a, a businessman, he was going on a journey, and so he called his three trusted servants to him, and he, he gave them different amounts of money, we could say. He, he invested in each one of them, and the, the master told them, take this money and do something with it. He gave it according to their experience and according to who they were and how they would use it. And two of the servants, what did they do? They went out and invested the money. Let's pick this up at uh, Matthew 25, 23. His Lord said unto him, Well done, good and faithful servant, for thou hast been faithful over few things. I'll make you rule over many things. Enter thou into the joy of the Lord. Again, that same verse, he said it to the first two people. Because what did they do? They did something with the talent he gave them. Oh, it wasn't all his money. It wasn't all his wealth. It was, it was just enough. But the first guy, didn't. he got more than the second guy. But they still both used it. But that third guy, he had something. But what did he do? I went and buried it. Well, why'd you bury it? Because I thought giving you back something was better than giving you nothing back in return. No. Master, I think in, in, we can read a little bit between the lines. He would have said, I would have better you have lost it and tried than just hide it somewhere. That guy was so proud to bring it. Master, I know you're mean, man. And I know you just, boy, boy, you really get on onto people. And I just... I hid it. I kept it safe for you. Aren't you happy? Instead of sowing, he hid it away. And instead of getting a reward like the other ones, he got a rebuke from that master. I don't want to be rebuked by the master. What am I doing with what he has given me? Another parable Jesus taught us, the, the parable of the talents, is about sowing and reaping, which has to do with more than just, obviously, money. Uh, when we're talking about the parable of the talent, being a, being a good steward means sowing whatever God has given you and then reaping the harvest from that. Your giftings, your skill sets, your assignments, your time, your anointing are all gifts from God. They are all gifts from your heavenly Father to be stewarded by you. He has placed those in your hands. God does not want you to live in fear where I'm just going to hide this because, God, I don't want to mess it up. He wants you to invest it, to give it away, to pour it out. That's why he has entrusted you with it. So, again, are you obedient? Am I obedient? Are we doing what God wants us to do? Because... When we start to do this, this is why steward, being a steward of this, will melt away fear because we believe this is not mine to just bury somewhere. This is God's. I'm going to pour it out. I'm going to give it away. I'm going to do something with it without fear of the outcome, without fear of what will happen. I'm going to do what God wants me to do with this. It's easy to assume that we don't have to start to steward what God has given us until it's big. That's not how the kingdom works. Good stewardship is not stewarding big things well. It's stewarding whatever we have, even if you think it's little, in a way that honors God and shows obedience to him. 
When I teach uh, level, we don't call them levels, first steps. Is that right? Yeah, when I teach the second life and first steps. We go through some values of the church, and, and we talk about ministering in this church and what it means. And, and so many times I, I, I use that. I said, when we, when we talk about this church, everybody can do something. And, and so I'll, I'll say things. And I've said in, a, in, in teaching before, you may have heard me say things like that. It's like, you know, on a Sunday morning, on a Wednesday night, who's the most important person in that church? Well, Brother Blaine, it's probably you. You're ministering the word of God. But if the windows were broken and there was weeds to your knees and the parking lot had trash everywhere and the electricity was off, you'd never come in this building to hear the word of God. So who's the most important? Maybe it's the person who cuts the grass. Maybe it's the person who makes sure the, makes sure the, the parking lot's cleaned up. Make sure some of the, maybe, maybe it's the tithe payers to make sure the lights are on and that Maybe it's the Jan's rule that, that makes sure the facility is clean. You understand, you can't just pinpoint that's the most important person. So you cannot categorize who has bigger talents and who has littler talents. Everybody is important in the kingdom of God. They just steward what they have. And so many times, I, I don't, I'm scanning the crowd, and this is a hard crowd to see because you're all in the wrong place, and this is the wrong place, and everything's wrong. But uh, I don't know where people normally sit, so... But I always use and I always talk about Sister Norris. I mean, what a lady. I remember Skyler was little. She'd sit there. We'd be on the platform singing and stuff. And she, you know what she did? Well, she has that uh, Mary Poppins purse anyway that just everything comes. I don't know how it all gets in that purse, but just it's a magic purse anyway. But she watched our son sometimes so that we could minister on the platform. Who was more important? You can't do that. I, re I remember hearing stories of her husband like, yeah, she's got a pantry or something in the house that looks like the Dollar General or something. She's got all these stuff, and she'll just be in there, and they're like, come on, Nancy, we got to go to church. What are you doing? Uh -huh. I just feel like somebody needs a gift today. And she'll put something in a bag, and here she comes in the church, and then some of you have been recipients of her. She just felt like somebody needed a gift today. Is that important? Oh, yes, that's important. She has a gift, and she stewards it well. Well, I can't sing. Can you write a letter? Can you shake a hand? Again, we're, we're, we're the ones comparing them. Oh, my, more that choir on Sunday. Oh, that big old choir. Boy, they rock the building and stuff. Oh, I could never do that. You don't have to. But probably that little gift that cost $1.25 because they raised prices on it at the Dollar Tree. <laughs> Handed to that person who was discouraged with a little card that says, I'm thinking and praying for you, meant a lot more than the choir up there rocking. So who's more important? You can't do that. This is the kingdom. There's no big eyes and little U's. Everybody is important. It's just I'm trying to convince some of us that we get so fearful because we can't. Or this is too much. This, this church, and I have people come through here. I've heard people that moved in there. This church, for whatever reason, there is a spirit sometimes of intimidation on people that we, because I can't do that, I'm not going to do it. You know, folks, ladies and gentlemen, everybody is an individual. You can do something. You can do something. Think of the most talented person and the most pers the person that goes to this church that you just stand in awe of everything they do and you are just wowed and mesmerized. You can do something they cannot do. What do you have that God has given to you that you need to steward? When David stepped onto that battlefield, he had been anointed as king of Israel, but he had not received the crown yet. It wasn't the time yet. And so in terms of resources, he had next to nothing. Saul had everything that David would someday have. Notice this. Saul had everything David would someday have. He was going to be Saul's brother. He was going to take over after Saul. That's who David was going to be. But he did not wait until he got into that position to fight the giant. He used what he had. 
He didn't have the popularity. He didn't have the wealth. He didn't have the big armor. He didn't have any of that stuff. He just simply had what he had, a shepherd boy with a little string and a little pouch of rocks on his side. So when he looked at that, and if he started to compare himself, thank God he didn't. He would have sat down and said, I can't do this. Look what this man has, and he's not willing to do this. Does not the Bible say something about comparing yourself among yourselves? It's kind of dumb. Don't do it. Do it to you. What can you do? David, on the other hand, he picked up everything he had. David had a staff, David had a pouch with rocks in it, David had a sling, and most importantly, David had a mandate that he felt was like from God, that he felt was from God, and he used every bit of it on the battlefield that day. He sowed everything he had. It was all or nothing out there. So what's in your hands right now? Not what you wish you had. What do you have right now? Real quick, let's go another direction. Moses is another clear example of this truth. God had appeared to Moses in a burning bush. You remember this? Let's read some of these scriptures in Exodus 3, starting at verse 1. Now, Moses was tending the flock of Jethro, his father-in-law. So he was out there. He had This is when he had ran away from Egypt. He is out there. He had a little white house He had a, with a little white picket fence. He had some kids. He was just doing his little, little thing on the backside of the desert. Tending his father-in-law's sheep, having a good life. He led the flock to the back of the desert, and he came to Horeb, the mountain of God. The angel of the Lord appeared to him in a flame of fire from the midst of a bush. So he looked, and behold, the bush was burning with fire, but the bush was not consumed. Then Moses said, smart guy, well, I think I'm going to look at this. I'm going to turn aside and see this great sight and why the bush isn't burning up. So when the Lord saw that he turned aside, I love that part, when the Lord saw he was going to come towards him, then God started to take action to see this great sight. And and God called to him from the midst of the bush and Moses, Moses. And Moses said, here I am. And he said, don't draw any closer. Take your sandals off your feet for the place you're standing is holy ground. Moreover, he said, I'm the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob. Moses hid his face for he was afraid to look upon God. And the Lord said, I have surely seen the impression of my people who are in Egypt. I've heard their cry because of their taskmasters for I know their sorrows. Verse 8, so I've come down to deliver them. God said, I have come down to deliver them out of the hand of the Egyptians and to bring them up from the land to a good and large land, to a land flowing with milk and honey, to the place of the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Mamorites, the Perizzites, the Hevites, and the Jebusites. Now, therefore, behold, the cry of the children of Israel has come to me, and I have also seen the oppression with which the Egyptians oppresses them. Come now, therefore, God said, I'm going to deliver them. And then in this verse, I'll send you. I'm going to send you to Pharaoh that you may bring my people, the children of Israel, out of Egypt. But Moses said to God, oh, no. Who, 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 who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and that I should bring the children of Israel out of Egypt? So he said again, I will certainly be with you, and this shall be a sign to you. I have sent you. When you have brought the people out of Egypt, you shall serve God on this mountain. Moses was terrified, and I think probably we all would be, rightly so. Three questions he asked. First of all, who am I? Moses said that I should go to Pharaoh, bring out the Israelites out of Egypt. Moses Moses questioned his own identity in God. God said, I'm going to deliver them. I need you to go for me. Who am I? How how could all these people, how could I fit in God's plan? Out of all these people, why did you choose me? Second question is, suppose I, I go to the Israelites and they say to me, and I tell them, God's talked to me, follow me out. They're all going to look at me and say, what if, what if they don't listen to me and say, you didn't hear from God. The Lord didn't appear to you. Confident that he wasn't qualified. Moses scared to death. Then he started to question whether or not the Israelites would believe him. If God had really sent them. And now we have the third thing that Moses brought up. Pardon your servant. He said, I can't talk good. I I don't don't have eloquent speech. I'm not a good public speaker. I can't do this, God. You're asking me to go to the most powerful man on earth. And I can't talk good. 
We, I, we don't know some people that may, he may have stuttered, he may have had a speech impediment, he just may have been a nervous wreck or just shut down in public speaking. Nobody really knows exactly, but he knew, I cannot do this. And this is so amazing to me with God. God knows that. That's probably why God chose him. Because it was going to have to be completely dependent on God. Fear had absolutely convinced Moses that he could literally, was unable to carry out his responsibilities. But thank God for his mercy. Thank God for his grace. Thank God for his kindness. God responded very, very lovingly to all of Moses' fears, answering all of his concerns. Then God switched this approach. This is what I'm trying to get to here. He was talking to Moses. Moses, I can't. I can't. I can't talk. I can't. I, no, somebody else do something. God says, what do you have in your hand? What does it matter what I have on my hand? Oh, it's very important what you have in your hand. Moses, what do you have in your hand? Well, it's, it's a staff. It's a shepherd's staff. It's what I've had. It's, it's what I've used for maybe 40 years I've used in the back of the desert. I've used it to fend off predators. I've used it to goat sheep. I've used it to, 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 to help me walk up a hill. I've, I've used it. It's dirty. It's crooked. It's, it's just this ugly staff is all I've got in my hand. But understand it was a symbol that God could use any person, and he can use anything to bring about his deliverance. Exodus 4.3, and he said, God said, cast that staff on the ground. And when Moses did, it turned into a snake. Moses took off running, rightly so. <laughs> Now, the next part's a bunch of faith. Grab it by the tail. <laughs> okay. And he touched it and brought it, and it was a staff again. Verse 5, that they may believe that the Lord God of their fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob, hath appeared to you. That staff, what you have in your hand, is going to be proof that I've spoken to you, that I'm going to do what I said I'm going to do. Yeah. Moses could have continued to argue with God, but his focus began shifting from his fear to his courage, from his resistance to his trust in God that, hey, God, I think you know what you're doing. When God breathes on something, when God does something in your life, no matter how small or meaningless we deem it, it can be used for the supernatural. All we have to do is steward what God has placed in our hands. If you follow that staff, and we don't have time to do it tonight, but if you follow that staff, he lifted that staff over and the Red Sea parted. He touched stuff and something happened. It was not this magic stick of any time, an abracadabra, nothing like that. God was just reminding him, and I think for future generations to tell us, he was just a shepherd, and all he had in his hand was a staff. But when he trusted God and he stewarded what he had, what great and miraculous things happened, and the children of Israel came out of Egypt because Moses had something in his hand. So that's why stewardship is a weapon against fear because it requires us to understand that we are called to manage what we have, not what we don't have. Oh man, if we had, a, if we had this much, if we had a good preacher around here, we'd, our church would probably grow. You, you can say what we don't have. What do we have? Let's steward what we have and give it to God and see what God can do with it. Do not make the mistake of overlooking what we already have, what you as an individual already have. Allow what you consider to be so small and insignificant to become instead a sign. Notice this. It was that staff that Moses kept looking at possibly when he was saying, I can't do this. I'm a shepherd. Do you see this? I'm a shepherd. God used that exact thing to catapult him into victory. So the thing that you have that you may think is just something that's almost restraining you from doing this may very well be the main thing God wants to use in your life to catapult you into victory, to do something through you. Steward it well and watch God use it to put you into the right positions, to put you into the right thing for a breakthrough in your life. And it wasn't just a breakthrough in Moses' life. It was a breakthrough for the entire country. It was a breakthrough for everybody. I'm telling you, ladies and gentlemen, there is enough talent and giftings and abilities if someone would just stir them up and break them out and put them in the hands of God. Let fear go by the wayside. Use what God has given you. And when you do, God is going to do great things through you. Can we stand together? 
And let's pray that God helps us and speaks to us. Don't be the servant that hid it away. Here, God, I got it for you. Do something with it. Well, what if I mess it up? It's his. Everything belongs to him. Use what he has given. Pray together. Thank you, Lord, for your goodness. Thank you, Jesus, for your power and that you entrust us with things. Lord, we want to be good stewards of everything that you have given to us. Help us to see, Lord, how we can do that. I pray, Lord, the things that maybe we we think are a a hindrance, Lord, I, I know that you have placed them, that you can turn those around and they can be used even for your glory. Touch each one of us, Lord, the things, the talents, the giftings, the abilities, whatever you have given to us as individuals. Let us not hide those things. Let us dust those things off, Jesus, because I know when we place them in your hands, I know when we use them for the kingdom, great and mighty things can happen. Bless us now, I pray. Give us wisdom, give us courage, give us boldness to go out and do your work, to do your will. Keep us in your care. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you all. So glad you're here.